This episode, I'm joined by Alice Gibson to discuss her book, The Ethics of Giacomo Leopardi, A Philosophy for the Environmental Crisis. I'd like to say a big thank you to my paying patrons and subscribers for making all of this work possible. And if you'd like to support the podcast and keep everything running, please find links in the description below. Otherwise, please enjoy. So, Alice Gibson, thanks very much for joining me on Hermetics Podcast. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. We are going to be discussing your book, The Ethics of Giacomo Leopardi, a Philosophy for the Environmental Crisis, which was published by Bloomsbury uh, 2023, I believe November 23 last year. And this is a book, as people will imagine, about the work of the Italian poet Leopardi, who most people will know um, as a pessimist, as a pessimistic thinker, uh, primarily, I would imagine, for his collection of poetry, Canti, um, but your book, alongside prov- providing uh, an introduction to Leopardi's thought um, in broad, really seeks to cr- not necessarily criticize, but look at that notion of Leopardian pessimism and put that to the side as a means to investigate how we can be ethically Leopardian, specifically in relation to our ongoing crisis and Leopardi's own sort of love and enjoyment and care for nature. I hope I've done a relatively okay job of, of talking about your book there. But before we jump into Leopardi and Leopardi and Thought and your book, please tell us a little bit about yourself, what it is you do, and yeah, the genesis of this uh, of this text. Thank you. That was, um, yes, um, you covered everything there, so thank you very much. Um, the text was born out of um, a kind of a feeling, I started off um, studying Kafka for my PhD studies and I found that a lot about Kafka had been written already and I was introduced through my interest in Kafka and um, uh, so-called sort of pessimistic thinkers to Leopardi and I I was struck by the conflict between delving into him and the experience of reading about him um, and the impression that I was getting, which informed my um, my desire to study him more, was that the way that he's considered is partly the, out- the outcome of the way that philosophy that's been translated into English is given a more of a platform. So, then the way that that impacts philosophy subsequently, um, it feels like there's been a knock-on effect of a lack of interest and uh, written work on Leopardi in English, and therefore there's been a little bit of a propagation of a narrative that's not quite uh, true to the experience of reading him and the work that lots of these um, books and references tended to refer to. Although having said that, things have changed quite dramatically in the last few years. Um, I think that there's a bit of a um, there's there's more and more people becoming interested in his thought, and I think that's partly because he's such a prescient thinker. Um, so that's how I came to Leopardi, and my uh, book came out of a, a PhD that I wrote, which was about um, fables. So that was about um, fables in relation to environmental catastrophe. So that was about identity and how. Um, environmental catastrophes informed our identity. So Leopardi wrote about um, the uh, significance of the eruption of Mount Vesuvius. Um, So that was sort of how I, again, my kind of entry point to Leopardi. Mm -hmm. Do you, I'm sorry, I'm veering off uh, the questions already. Do you, do you, do you, um, do you consider him a pessimist? Maybe that, like, to people who know of Leopardi, that might seem like a really obvious question. But do you, the the group of thinkers he's often thrown amidst, when you read Leopardi, he doesn't really seem to fit. So, do you consider him a pessimist? I I don't, and I think that might I've I I struggle with how much I'm extrapolating from his thought and how much I'm being true to his thought. And um, because I've been very interested in showing his relevance today, mm-hmm. um, I think sometimes I might sort of walk a sort of thin line. 
uh, with sort of representing him and trying to make him fit today because there's lots of things about his thought which are best left in the past, even though there's other things which are really worth bringing into the future and I think referring to. Um, nonetheless, I think that part of the experience of um, going into the works that have been celebrated for me has been um, pointing to what's really generative about his work. And I think that there's... Um, he he was there's a quote which I'm uh, always kind of guided by in the Zibaldone, which is um, his kind of large diary where he was always keeping his um, record of his thoughts, which sort of uh, lots of his other works were kind of born from. He was talking about um, his desire later in his life when he was developing his philosophy to want to sort of create a cure or. Earlier on in his work, he was looking at the ailments and he was focusing on them. I think that there's perhaps more familiarity with that earlier work. Um, whereas what what I think happens when you um, look at the thread of his work is you sort of start to see him contending with that and trying to work through it. So I think really actually being true to his work, he wouldn't want to be called a... a um, uh, pessimist because that wouldn't do due credit to the work that he was trying to do in his philosophy later in his life or in his writing career mm. so what really what when what was your first sort of appreciations of his work then when you first did you uh, was it immediate and an immediate sort of falling falling in love with his work or was there a specific aspects that you yeah that drew you to i think so i think i was really lucky to be pointed to him uh, with there being so little written about him because he's so thoughtful and his um, writing so rich, you could kind of delve deeper and deeper. Um, and with the Zibaldone, his um, his kind of hodgepodge, it's called, that's so extensive. And he was very, um, very thorough in the way that he was uh, writing about all of these ideas, although he would sort of write, write in it, um, over a period of time. He was very uh, methodical in his indexing of it. So he covers so many different topics and he kind of webs it together, which in itself is fascinating from the time that he was writing. There's been sort of a digital platform that's been made that visualises the mapping of the ideas in the work, which I think really shows um, how how clever he was to be able to do that <laughs> back in uh, the time that he was writing. So um, I, I think it's... Um, the nature of finding how how considered he was about so many topics, the relationship to how it speaks about the ince inception of problems that have become embedded in our society today, I think that's what really fascinated me. And that that appreciation in his uh, poem La Genestra, which is in the county, of um, the impact of both the, again, the impact of... Um, environmental catastrophes on our identities and the way that was represented in La Genestra, I think that's kind of what really captured me and his humour as well um, because he was very he was very sarcastic and kind of um, sort of made a point of being quite critical of people at particular points in his work which um, would be um, yes, he was he was trying to get a response from people I think uh, and a particular type of engagement, um, and I think he does that quite um, cleverly. Mm -hmm. I guess it's just to add in like a brief amount of biographical detail, if we can. I guess I'm just got the years. Do you know the year, like his year of birth and death, just to ground people? Yes. So he was born in 1798, and he died in 1837. So he he didn't get to 40. He had um, health problems throughout his life. Um, quite extensive ones, really. Um, and he he wrote the Zibaldone. Um, I don't have to hand the period that he that he started writing it in, I'm afraid. Mm. Um, but the Operette Morale, which I've referred to, the inception of that was um, 1820 was when he first kind of started considering it and he used to write to his... A uh, friend, um, uh, Pietro Giordani. So, the sort of inception of it is seen to be in a 
a letter that he wrote to to Giordani where he said, almost to take revenge on the world and on courage, I've imagined I've imagined and sketched out certain satirical prose pieces. And that's seen seen as the kind of birth of the opera morale. And then he wrote the majority of them in 1824. Um, and he was writing them over a few years and he added some on later as well. Um, but then in terms of that poem, La Genestre, which I referred to, that was his last, um, that was in the last years of his life. So I think that was 1837. Um, and that was when he was overlooking, he was in a house where he could see Mount Vesuvius. And mm-hmm. um, so it was very much in his vision uh, in his field of vision when he was writing. Um, yeah. So, so, yeah. One thing, I mean, not to focus too much on the pessimistic angle, but just to dip back to that very, very yeah. briefly. One might think with his, with his life, with the extensive, as you say, extensive health conditions, which I was looking up, I think now they think it might have been POTS disease. Like it was a very serious spinal condition, probably would have been in chronic pain almost constantly kind of, kind of, deal but from this from like with regards to the, the pessimistic angle and his writing it doesn't really seem when you read uh, especially when you read the canty that this is like a pessimistic escape from life there is as you said uh, a richness to his writing and a sort of dare i say like a, a melancholic vitality you know there's something that he absolutely adores about life so i don't think he's always trying to escape but at the same time, um, at one and the same time, he's always there's always a hesitancy. Sorry, that's more of a comment. But um, he could like he could very well be justified in just trying to escape life, for, or or being bitter or frustrated at life. But that doesn't come across in his writing. And I think his work is really marked by a stubbornness about really being um, truthful about the situation that he's in and he's quite cutting to people who uh, he sees as not being and I think sometimes he um, he was he was very disappointed that his work wasn't sort of received in the way that he wanted it to be when he was writing um, and maybe that informed to some degree um, that feeling but I don't think that I, I think really I agree in terms of his work seems to be struck by a yearning for more vitality and he he doesn't give up hope in that vision. I think he is driven by it and I think the sort of later philosophical poetry that he's writing, what he's trying to do is he's trying to create an enthusiasm um, about life um, and he's trying to show that things can be um, – much more positive than they are, and I think that's that's what I'm really fascinated about with his work. There's, um, I think it was. Let me just check, and if you don't mind, just want to get the reference right. Um, yes. So from the Gospel of John, um, there was a quote that he uses. I think it's at the beginning of um, La Genestra, which is kind of contextualizes the poem, mm-hmm. and it says. And men loved darkness rather than the light. So that's John three nineteen, and that's that's like it's his the starting point of the poem. Then the poem feels like a rebuttal of that um, stance. So I think that he's always always trying to get away from and always trying to hold fast to the idea that things don't have to be um, the way they are, and that sometimes it's a bit self fulfilling to be. Um, so focused on the pessimistic side of things, which I think is why I'm so passionate about trying to point to the the positive side of what he's working on. And he didn't used to think of himself as a philosopher earlier in his life. Um, he saw himself more expressly and explicitly as a poet. And then he um, describes right, uh, reading um, Madame de Steele, who enabled him to see that you can be both a poet and a philosopher at the same time. So then he kind of embraced that part of his identity. And I think that that kind of play with genres really um, was, and still is, something that makes him so um, useful to look at today. Mm -hmm. There's one thing I want to add in, because I'd like to get your your opinion on this, because I had read some of the, the... Canty a long time ago, and then before our discussion went through uh, the whole, uh, this is the Penguin Classics edition, and this meant that 
the way this is um, structured is that the first, it seems to go through poems about, you could say, Italy and the past, then through poems of love, and then, um, I guess, more so, I don't know. But that seemed to be the structure. But anyway, the point was that it begins with these poems about uh, to Italy, on the monument to Dante being erected in Florence, um, and a hymn to the patriarchs. And there's with these poems, I was my immediate thoughts were, I would usually absolutely be bored to death by such a poem because he's um, he's writing in such a way that he's like harking back to something. But at the same time, I was completely bowled over by them. So I was like, why why are these not just falling apart? Because they you, such a such an idea of like, oh, I you know this country used to be so great is kind of ridiculous. And at one of the same time. Um, he is, I'm trying to pull this all together. It seems that one at the same time, he is um, acknowledging that that is gone, but there was something there that can still be sort of enjoyed in its vital spirit. But at the same time, as you, the reason I bring this in is because you mentioned this sort of his, I guess, sarcasm and maybe cynicism with regards to seeing the world as it is. And so we're heading, you know, with these years, basically, I guess, the late 18th century through to early 19th, um, heading swiftly into modernity and so there's sort of not necessarily a romanticism but a melancholy of you know of old italy and of of this old sort of spirit that's gone but the reason these worked for me that i thought they were more than just a sort of um i don't know say a nationalistic poem was that he is a he is a one and the same time acknowledging look this is this is gone come on and i oh. think oh sorry or am i just completely off the off the mark there no, I think you've hit on something that a lot of um, my reading of Leopardi kind of hinges on, which is, I think, one of perhaps one of the reasons why he's um, seen as being a pessimist so much is because of the extent to which he was informed by the Stoics. Um, so what he was, and I mean, Stoicism's become a bit more popularised in the last few years, but when he was and being examined by uh, philosophers in the 70s, uh, there was a sort of mockery of that sense of um, referring to Stoicism in Leopardi. It was kind of seen as unfashionable, whereas today I think we're better positioned to be able to uh, give that idea a bit more credibility. And one of the things that I examine, examine in uh, the book that you mentioned is that he he seems to be he seems to me to be on a project of trying to revive what's useful from the ancients and bring it into modernity um i struggled when i was first reading him to see um to get the balance right with to what extent that's useful and to what extent that's um problematic um and i think where where i've kind of landed is I'm thinking in particular of the way that his notion of um, nature. So I think it's it's either Seneca or uh, Marcus Aurelius who talk about philosophy as being a practice of being a uh, 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 one with nature. So that's very different to the notion of uh, of nature that sort of he arrived at later in his life. So Leopardi used to be quite um, prone to that way of thinking earlier on in his um, work. And then he started engaging with people who had been thinking through the results of uh, the impact of the 1755 earthquake that happened on All Saints Day in Lisbon. And that was, that really radically shifted the way that people thought, or well, that was sort of like a another example of one of those catastrophes that really had reverberations that have impacted the way that nature is thought about in the West today. And um, so nature is seen as, an enemy and there's almost there's a poem sorry not a poem there's um a piece in the operette morale which is a collection of uh, short essays and um, which is about it's talking about um two characters one being nature and one being an icelander and they're having a conversation and that um critics have kind of focused on that as that turning point um but where i'm going with this because i've kind of gone on a few threads is I think his work would be more um it wouldn't it wouldn't have some of the hurdles that it does have later on if he had stuck 
by that sort of stoic notion of our our relationships to nature and not moved away from it into the more sort of modern split with nature. Um, So I think he... He's. I really think that something that's really useful about reading him today is getting a sense of how we can draw on the wisdom of the past um, and how we can use it for today. And um, that's one of the things that I really like about his thinking. Uh, sometimes, though, it is held back by that can't be possible today uh, in sort of modern life. But I think on the whole, um, that's a sort of a guide which I think is something worth following from his work. Mm-hmm. So on the topic of modernity, which is, I guess if there is, um, yeah, if maybe if there's like two pillars here, it's modernity and nature, though I don't want to put them into a binary because I think Leopardi would probably have problems with that as well. Um, but Leopardi is right in the, I guess it's right in the midst really of the birth of what we would now consider to be modernity when those ideals were very much uh, in favor, enlightenment ideals, maybe. My, my time's a bit wrong there. Um, what is modernity for him? What does he see? What does he see arriving? Um, he is very critical of the celebration of progress that is was popular in his time. Um, I think that was another thing that really drew me to him. And I think is another reason why he's really key to look at today because he's an example of someone who is a lot more critical about what is at stake in order to enable some people to live and what's sort of celebrated as uh, the benefits of um, of sort of modern civilization. Um, so he he's as cutting as saying that um, modernity is barbaric. So he is talking about that in terms of explicitly appreciating that uh, that the exploitation of different people um, enables the luxuries of others, Uh, and he was he was recognizing that at a time that other people around him weren't. So um, that's one of the things which I think makes him really key to look at because I'm hesitating because I wanted to I kind of. I don't know if it's okay if I just read out a short passage because it kind of ties the two yeah. things together that we we're talking about. So he says, this comes from the Z- Zibaldone, uh, but just on the topic of what you were saying about looking back to the past, what he wrote was, we still need to recover much from ancient civilization, by which I mean the Greeks and the Romans. Consider the many ancient institutions which have fo- been very recently been revived. Schools and the use of gymnastics, bathing and similar practices. The tendency over these recent years more than ever before towards social improvement has brought about and continues to do the renewal of many ancient practices both physical political and moral which have been abandoned and forgotten during barbarous times from which we've not yet entirely emerged the current progress of civilization is still a revival it consists for the most part in recovering what has been lost so what he's he's um questioning the notion that we have emerged from barbarous times and he's um putting a big question mark over that and highlighting um that the progress of civilization isn't a given in the same way that he's seeing his contemporaries uh suggesting that it is um i wanted to mention that as well because he's you can get that sense of that kind of yearning for i think it speaks to his health conditions and things as well that yearning for sort of movement and vitality um and i think that he thinks that that was perhaps more accessible in the past than it, it is in his time yes not sure if i've mm-hmm. gone off on are, we, um, are we still barbaric do you think yes i think so and i think that's why um sorry maybe i should have thought about that more but <laughs> i think um yeah i mean i think that he is I was thinking about this earlier today in terms of the way that the climate crisis is being engaged with um, and the way that we're seeing our governments and political institutions responding. um, There's not the sense of urgency that we would have if we were to be, um, if we were to actually be aligned with the kind of values that we celebrate as having 
Um, so I'm thinking about uh, the unjust um, way that people in um, living in areas that are affected most heavily by the environmental crisis have had the least to do with it. Um, so I think there's a there's a quote that I was trying to find from him where he's talking about um, in his time, people appreciated that people with white skin and people with black skin were equal, yet at the same time, slavery was still going on. So he uses that as, as an example of the way that we can think one thing and still use practices which are exploitative. Mm. And I think that's what he's getting at when he's talking about barbarism. So I think that that has parallels with the um, the lack of the engagement with the environmental crisis that we're still um, living in today. So, yes, um, but I do appreciate this sounds pessimistic. <laughs> um, One thing I'd like to focus on just on this set on within this question, though, is this word barbarism. I don't know if there's any specific reason. It's a very specific word. Does this have a relationship with uh, like the the ancient Greeks and um, you know the the so as he says we haven't moved from the barbarism that we once believed we were in like we're still barbaric is there a it's a very specific word basically is there a reason for his usage of it not well I'm not aware of one I've not thought of it that way um which is why I don't want to say no I mean he's using it as a dichotomy against sort of civilization and progress he's using it as a um the flip side of it. Um, the way that I kind of think of it when I go into it is uh, when Maya Angelou is talking, there's an um, interview with her and she's talking about um, the barbarism of racism. So I think I've kind of gone into it through looking at le- that lens, um, which I think he is he is saying. And I don't think I'm projecting that onto him. <laughs> I think that he is he, that is what he's uh, thinking about. But in terms of the lineage of where he's got that from, from uh, whether or not it's come from sort of Greek literature, I'm not sure. Mm. Um, but it's something for me to go away and look into. So thank you. Well, so on this sort of uh, this dichotomy, I guess, between civilization, progress, all these things we take for still take for granted, which um, we might see, I guess, as a dichotomy against barbarism and um, I don't know chaos. It seems that uh, for Leopardi, he's making it clear that actually. With regards to exploitation, civilization is built on top of barbarism, and you know all our comforts are really to do with the exploitation of others. We're out of sight, out of mind. But this, for me, brings in nature because for him, I think it seems that how he understands nature is in very much the same way as we like to make a comfortable split where we're in control and nature is over there, and we can go and tame it and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. But as you have brought in this earthquake from uh, Lisbon, which I believe killed like something like fifty thousand people, this seems like a symbol of we will never be in we we will never be in charge of nature. We and it sort of replaces or reframes what the human is, how we conceive of what the human being even is. And it's like prior to that, we were very comfortable. We have a controlled and orderly civilization uh, where we, you know, nature is in the nature park and we draw borders. But then there's this great big explosion from nature and all of a sudden we are sort of relegated, I guess, back to the animal kingdom. Is that somehow somehow how he sees nature this is what I'm thrown surprised. a bit too much, sorry? No, I think that's that's what I find so interesting about looking at work that's looking at how our identities are shaped by by catastrophes, because they force us to confront the um the fragility of our narratives and they they force us to question how how solid they are and um, i think what he's very good at doing is um showing the extent to which we're historically quite terrible at seeing challenges to our dominant narratives and absorbing them so that's one of um the things that i find really interesting in his work um with with the sense of nature, I think what's interesting about that and the time is that the scientific revolution uh, was about being able to control um, and exert control and sort of extract from the earth. And I think 
being shaken um by being um confronted with um these sorts of events are really what um what make these sorts of things so uh, important to look at um I'm not sure if I've touched on your point have I answered your point <laughs> <laughs> I guess to follow up what what do you what what was Leopardi's? Did he have a positive relationship with nature? So there is this uh, sense in which nature rocks our narratives and, and, you know, is the, like, inherent critique within our dominant ideas. But did from that, did he then form what nature was? Because that seems to be a very... Um, it does something to the human which really puts us, puts us somewhere else. I previously mentioned that um, piece in the operette Morale, which is talking about the uh, conversation between the nature and the ice nature and the Icelander. So nature is um, personified, and the Icelander is trying to flee from civilization. So the Icelander has found that he's getting lots of um, uh, lots of grief from his neighbours and other um, civilians, and he decides to try and get away from humankind and just live a solitary life. And in doing so, he bumps into nature, the embodied version of nature, who is a very um, sort of feminised character in Leopardi. So that's been subjected to critique. Um, But he has a conversation with her and complains about how, um, how vicious she is against people. And that's, that's why I think there's been this focus on, so he sort of talks about being battered by the winds and the, all of the um, storms that he's been subjected to since living since leaving civilization. So this is the the piece which people have focused on to show that that reference to the Stoics that kind of informed his way of looking at nature previously, which I think was also informed by uh, Rousseau and him reading Rousseau, that kind of shifted. This was that period that he was looking at um, the way that. Uh, people like Alexander Pope and Leibniz were referring to the um, the 1755 earthquake. And that, to me, I think that it's not necessarily just that piece. And I think that there's, with, with his work, there's always kind of, you can see things born in some places, which then become crystallised later. But nonetheless, this is the kind of crystallisation of that idea that he has, that we're completely separate from nature. So... When he then turns to uh, La Genestra later on, which he wrote after um, Nature and the Icelander, nature is presented in that as our enemy and our enemy which we should be unified against. So in his um, poem there, which is a philosophical poem, this is kind of informed by that change that happened earlier on in his life where he read Madame de Steel and conceived of himself as a philosopher and a poet. So this is seen as a philosophical poem. He was calling for unity. Um, so he's going against that notion that the Icelander had, that we need to sort of live solitary lives and saying that that unity needs to be um, originating. It needs to originate from our opposition to nature and we need to be uh, in solidarity against nature. So this is one of the things which I think, I think that was kind of, an exposition of what I was referring to earlier when I think that we should go back to his earlier notion of nature. And I think we can also, we've got lots of benefit from thinkers who have come after him. Um, so people like Rachel Carson, who really shows that um, us and also the notion of uh, Gaia from James Lovelock, um, these kind of ideas which throw into question that that idea of separation. So I think where we kind of are today is we're kind of caught within a legacy of um, seeing nature as something that can be extracted from as a result of that sort of celebration of civilization being kind of being able to be scientific and make things molded to meet the sort of human um, plans and conditions and things. And the reality of the fallout of that. Um, so there's more and more catastrophes. So I think this is kind of where what I've kind of arrived at thinking lately is so much hinges on the way that we respond to those and even more so now because there's going to be so much, so many more um, as a result of, because 
the notion of kind of natural disasters is a contested one. Um, but we're living in anthropogenic times. We're, we're living in um, the Anthropocene now. So that's the idea then is that um, the, the way that we've engaged with the environment has been shaped by humans. So lots of the disasters have been um, caused by us. So I think we need to be really careful how we um, respond to that to sort of make sure that we're not exacerbating um, a problem which we should really be seeing these sorts of things as warnings um, about. Um, hopefully that makes some sense. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So really then Leopardi isn't so much someone who foresaw how we would abuse the environment as much as possibly his later work being a bit of a foundation for our relationship with the environment of this unification against it, or at least a um, a mindset which is one of, of control and domination with respect, like, you know, I guess for me, I can't help but see the sort of a biographical element with respect to the vitality coming in again, where this possibly is, I mean, I'm maybe like projecting a little bit, but it's possibly a man sort of yearning that we're wishing that he could have that control over his own biology, his own nature, which is completely basically against him. Right. Um, but that might be psychoanalyzing a bit too much. Well, he was met with that in his time that, um, that was kind of, um, suggested to, well, a, 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 a variation of it. So some people, uh, were saying that he was pessimistic as a result of his health conditions. Um, and he was, again, very cutting in his response and um, sort of saying, um, you're not, not getting at the crux of what he was trying to do. So, but I think sometimes just because he says one thing, I mean, in that case, I think that that was, um, I do think that he's not a pessimist ultimately. Um, but I think in some cases there are moments in his work where what he explicitly says doesn't necessarily match up with what he's doing. Um, but in terms of um, applying him today as well, he did have a sense of there's there's another um I'm just trying to remember the name of it. It's Copernicus, uh, which is a dialogue that happens in the Operette Morale. And in that he's talking about the way that we're not very good at appreciating um the limits of our resources. So he says in that that it's very likely again, let's see if I can do you mind if I just quote again? Mm-hmm. There's this is um uh, one of the characters in this uh, dialogue uh, of Copernicus. Um, so the sun has refused to carry on moving around the earth. And this is an example of uh, Leopardi shining a light on our inability to kind of uh, agree with changes that happen. So if we're having uh, scientifically and to kind of bring them into our identity. So there's the first hour of the day who is having a conversation with the sun and trying to persuade the sun, who's being very stubborn, to continue going around the earth. And uh, the sun's having none of it, so they have to recruit Copernicus in. Um, But at some point in in this, the first hour says to the sun, um, who's just said, you need to carry on, who's just said, I'm not going to do um, going around the earth anymore. Uh, The first hour says, and what way does your excellency think the poor wretches might find? to go around the earth and having to find uh, to to light the day and having to find having to fuel their lamps or provide enough candles to burn all through the day will be an exorbitant expense if they had already discovered that kind of air that can be used for burning and to light their streets rooms shops cellars and everywhere and all at little expense then i would say that the case was not so bad but the fact is we have 300 years to go more or less before men discover the remedy and in the meanwhile, they will have run out of oil and wax and pitch and tallow, and they will have nothing more to burn. So I kind of feel like that um, kind of captured in that is Leopardi's um, view that we are going to continue to extract and utilise resources regardless of the outcome, even if that means that we're not going to have light in the day. I mean, I also think that's interesting that he... He was also hopeful there. This was him projecting what it would be like in 300 years and um, that we were going to have the means to be able to um, uh, use fuel. Um, 
and we do have the means, but we're still extracting oil. So I kind of, I think there's a sort of a bit of a dichotomy in his thinking there. Mm. He has a strange relationship there with, I guess, with the earth, though, in a way that the earth clearly doesn't care about humans. Um, I'm not sure where, I, I think I've taken this quote from, this is either Leopardi or right. I really should have put pages here, so my apologies. But now that they've all vanished, the earth does not feel she is lacking anything. The rivers are not wary of flowing, and the sea, though it no longer has to serve for traffic and navigation, does not seem to be drying up. And this notion of the earth really, I guess, a Leopardian, anti-anthropocentric, like, we can drain everything from the earth, but we will just die out and the earth will still be here. But Leopardi seems to project a sort of guilt onto nature, like a sort of shaming nature that it hasn't looked after us or something along these lines. But it's still, he can't really just allow nature to fully be just what it is. Without us, we still always play a role for him. I mean, that's what kind of informs that resentment that kind of then informs his later philosophy, that sort of notion of nature being an enemy. And that that um, was from one of his earlier um, uh, pieces in the opera Morale. So that's kind of when I was referring before that he talks about um, his philosophy being like a cure. Those earlier works were sort of diagnostic. So what I like, really like in those works is where he's sort of saying... I read that piece as being focused on, um, I mean, he was very informed by Lucian of Samosata, so he was writing lots of sort of satirical pieces very, very early on that were mocking the kind of idea of anthropocentrism that we're we're kind of very used to seeing um, ridiculed and critiqued today. But Leopardi was an early ex- example, using an even earlier inspiration of doing this. So I read that piece as him mocking us for thinking that the world would give a tip if we all died out the next day. And um, so I hadn't thought about things in terms of that also, um, speaking to his idea of that nature should be um, should be caring. But that, that, that there is a conversation that happens in that Nature and Icelander uh, piece where the Icelander kind of pre- presents that to nature and nature sort of talks about there being necessity of a cycle of um, uh, of destruction, which enables other life. So, does does Leopardi consider that he uh, his philosophy did outline a cure for the world? Um, I I kind of see that he completed. It's a bit hard to, because he died so young, um, to kind of not project onto sort of when his last work was, whether that was sort of seen as being the completion of his kind of uh, writing career. But what what he completed with La Genestra, I think that he fulfilled in the same way that he, um, when he was writing earlier on to Pietro Giordani, that he wanted to create some satirical uh, dialogues. I think he achieved that with the operette Morale. And when he was writing in the Zabaldone about uh, Madame de Steel, he talks, he takes from Madame de Steel a kind of sense of aesthetic theory where he's talking about works of genius, which is something that she um, touches on in uh, Corinne. And he, he focuses on the way that works of genius kind of install a sense of enthusiasm uh, whilst also being true to uh, going back to that kind of being able to face the truth sort of uh, stance that he likes to adopt. I think that is what he achieves in um, La Genestra. Um, so I, I do think that he does, I think that he has quite a good track record of sort of sort of setting out to do something and then accomplishing it. Mm. Um, and we're very lucky in the Zibaldone, being able to have recourse to the Zibaldone and his letters to see what he was intending on doing and then being able to compare that to what he did. Um, yeah. It should be said, for those that don't know how just how big the Zibaldoni is, I think if you were to order it, it's something like 2,000 2, pages, but the original is... Maybe nearly three, actually. Nearly I three. Know. And I think the original yeah. is about 4,000 pages. Yes, I think, yeah. In the, in the Italian. And was it six six translators to fully complete the translation, I think, or something like that? And it took them... It was translated in 2013... And I think, I'm not sure if I'm getting it mixed up or not. I'm not sure if it took them seven years or 13 years, but mm-hmm. an extensive amount of time. Mm-hmm. Um, 
I think it was seven years. Um, but again, the fact that he did this sort of to the extent that he did and then mapped the indexes, he was a very thorough thinker and methodical. Mm. So to draw, uh, I guess in a way, hopefully a productive, which is to use a very modern word, box around our conversation thus far and just point towards uh, hopefully a trajectory with respect to the, the ethics part of your title. There was there was a question that I was going to bring in earlier, but it seems apt to bring it in now with regard to this idea of bringing from the past what is uh, what is good. Um, looking at our relate, obviously very broadly, looking at our relationship with nature, also looking at our relationship with modernity and our presumptions, our dominant ideas. But this idea of employing weapons of passion, feeling, and imagination is this where you possibly see the, like the foundation of a, an ethical direction which we can take from Leopardi. Yes. Um, there's a kind of, at the beginning of the Zibble Donor, he talks about um, the problem of us being cut off from nature. And then he talks about how in a few hundred years, he he says that maybe this is something to talk about in a few hundred years. And then just before he says that, he just has a short sentence that says dreams and vision. So what I've kind of tried to do is focus on bringing together his very, uh, his reference to dreams and vision with his focus on sort of passion and enthusiasm um, and that kind of generative aspect of his work. I think that that's a good starting point um, for a kind of ethics that can be uh, used in the present. Um, there's a, uh, I think one of the things which he doesn't do, which he maybe would do if he were read if he were writing today, is reflect. I mean, La Genestra, It's um, it, the the kind of the protagonist, not not the protagonist, the main subject is a um, a broom plant. So uh, it's sort of a yellow. Uh, a kind of bushy plant with yellow flowers, and it lives on the on the side of bank uh, of Mount Vesuvius. And this is seen as the representation in his work of the kind of stance that we should adopt when we're facing um, the vulnerability of our sort of our lives in the face of um, sort of catastrophe um, or vulnerability. So he he does start to use non-humans so plants and he, he references uh animals that share um the the mount the sort of the banks of the mountain as their home but he never really delves into it i think that if he were write, writing today he would be much more focused on that sort of side of things so there's a book that i've just discovered by um someone called Nuar al sadir um and she's a psychoanalyst i think and she's focused on um, sort of poetry and how it can have sort of uh, a method, how it can sort of be provocative and help sort of self-revelation and things. And that's talking about animal joy. And she's referring to sort of laughter and how generative it can be. So I sort of, I haven't done it yet, but I'm thinking of reading that book in tandem with sort of where it would be nice to take off from Leopardi. Um, but yes, I'm kind of, trying to follow a trajectory of what it means for Leopardi to not be a pessimistic thinker and for him to actually be someone who's trying to um, cultivate enthusiasm and see how we can build an ethics in, in today's moment when we're um, faced with a multitude of crises. Mm. Well, I think just with this, uh, I guess to, to go full circle in a way, with this idea of Leopardi being a pessimist, I think of, so I read the Canty and then the Moral Fables were the two that I read prior to our discussion. And um, you speak of in, like enthusiasm and I think maybe in content of, of what is just happening or the discussions that are explicitly happening in the stories are certainly pessimistic at times. But as you say, using flowers as characters or one of my personal favorites from Moral Fables, which was the discussion between fashion and death, um, that in itself is such an enthusiastic idea that immediately you doubt whether or not such a such a writer could really have you know that much pessimistic scorn for life if 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 he is constantly uh, 
having these ideas that are filled really with vitality and filled with all kinds of um, strange, well, basically strange enthusiastic ideas. And it seems to always be clashing that at one and the same time he wants to be a pessimist, but his style sort of betrays him. Um, yeah. And that, um, I was thinking as you were talking, the the dialogue between fashion and death as well, that was used by uh, Walter Benjamin in The Arcades Project. So he cites it 13 times in The Arcades Project, um, which then in turn would have, um, it's just a bit of a side reflection from what you just said, which in turn would have affected Adorno. And then Adorno, I have I kind of did my MA thesis on um, the relationship between humans and animals in Adorno. But again, he kind of, he's talking about um, using, turning to animals to see how to live an ethical life. Um, so I kind of, that doesn't, that's a sort of series of reflections bouncing off, coming off of your your um, pointing to fashion and death. But I think that that's because that dialogue, the the lack of familiarity of it, also um, speaks to the lack of um, recognition that he's had on his on the impact of um, uh, philosophy. Since I'm not saying that Adorno's um, work was necessarily in that type in that way of thinking explicitly informed informed by Leopardi but Benjamin's was and the fact that people are so familiar with with Benjamin but not familiar with this piece even though it's cited 13 times um is um perhaps again one of the reasons why um this this sort of story that doesn't tell all the story is said about Leopardi mm-hmm. where would you advise people to begin with Leopardi I think the operette morale, um, because they're very short pieces, they're dialogues, you can kind of dip into them. And there's one which is, I think, I mean, I think my favourite is the dialogue of Her- Hercules and Atlas and the dialogue of the Earth and the Moon, which are within the moral essays. But there's one which um, I think is quite interesting today. Uh, I thought it was quite interesting a few years ago when... Um, the the world champion Go player was sort of um, beaten, I think it was by something that was developed by Google or something. But with the conversations that are happening in terms of AI these days, he wrote uh, a sort of pretend prize, which was called uh, the Announcement of Prizes offered by the Academy of Solographers. And what this is was a sort of a call for submissions for people to make robots that would be uh, sort of a good best friend or a good girlfriend or a good whatever. And he was writing this in the early 1800s. Um, so I would kind of, I've, I've, I would like to see more work that was kind of looking at more of the history of that sort of thinking, um, which would be including that. So I would point to that in the first instance, I think. Mm-hmm. Okay. And also the Zibel Dono, just because you can dip into it, um, even though it's enormous. Um, I think dipping into it is really fruitful. Is it available online? Um, there's the uh, Zibaldone project, so that's the kind of dig- digital platform um, which it's been kind of mapped onto. Mm-hmm. So I think if you Google the Digitone uh, hypertext platform, it might be being. I think it might be being revised at the moment, um, but I'm pretty sure it's available there. Mm-hmm. Just because the actual text itself is sort of as big as the doorstop, it's enormous. So, yeah. Is there anything you'd like to add about your book or Leopardi that you feel is key that we haven't touched upon? Um, thank you for the question. I think um, I've I've tried to sort of restrain from giving too many quotes. So um, there's kind of more, more kind of explicit um, examinations of the things I vaguely referred to in the book. Um, but I think, I think we've sort of covered everything. Um, I just encourage people to sort of um, enjoy reading Leopardi themselves, I think. Okay. Are you currently working on more on Leopardi? Um, I'm currently working on... Um, my When I was writing the book, I sort of found myself looking at this notion of planetary solidarity mm-hmm. um, and kind of uh, 
this this notion that I was looking at with where where Leopardi is talking about uh, La Genestra as an example of and um, behaving well and kind of embodying a noble spirit. So what I've been trying to do is to see what extending solidarity beyond just between people and to humans and to animals, and then also on a planetary scale would look like. And I've I've been looking at that in relation to some of the sort of scientific conversations that have been happening in kind of the realm of things like One Health and Planetary Health, because it feels to me like there's a bit of a split between where philosophy's at in terms of critiquing anthropocentrism and where sort of scientists are thinking uh, and there's not being too much communication between the two. So I'm kind of working on a project of seeing if I can bring together some bridges between the, those sorts of fields of thought, if I can. We'll see how it works, see if it happens. That sounds very interesting. Um, I will be sure to put links for your book in the description below, but I feel um, it's a great place to finish up. Fantastic. Thanks, Thanks very, very much. much. Thank you. Thank you.